Okay, so we like to start out the evening by giving some context. And the context that I was thinking about epidemic, and, and bear with me as I stumble through this a bit, um, this was done at about 3 p.m. today, because Tamara's sick, and she had a great presentation, but I didn't know what it was about. Um, <laughs> And when I think about epidemics, it's really easy to focus on the disease and the death, and, uh, and then in modern epidemics, the process that goes around pre preventing the death and isolating the disease. But we should also consider the life and the art that comes along with it. In Europe, uh, in the mid-1300s, Europe was hit by a horrifying pandemic of the Black Death. And is that actually animating? No. If I click one more time, is it going to animate? Yes, okay, so it's animating. Um, and it swept across the continent, and it killed 30% of the population. And then it came back, and like a tsunami, it came back again and again and again, and it pulsed through countries, and every about 10 years, it would pop up in a city or a country. Um, and it did this for hundreds of years, a couple hundred years, until it crescendoed in the late uh, 1600s, where in London, there was a fire that ended it. Now, that fire may or may not have been set on purpose by people who had started to understand what may or may not have been spreading it. And death is a powerful motivator, and more than that, surviving death is a powerful muse. Imagine for a moment that for decade after decade, you had watched your loved ones died and you were, faced to f you were forced to face your own mortality. If you survived all that, you were elated. Like, holy crap, you, you won the lottery. You are one of the few people that survived. And I'm pretty sure that society would forgive you for having a fairly twisted way of celebrating life in the face of knowing that you might die at any minute. Because it wasn't as if they knew at that last plague that it was done. They, they thought maybe in 10 years it's gonna come back and kill them all. It wasn't as if even after that 10 year mark they knew that the plague was gone. It took years for them to really shake that from the collective, collective subconscious. So it's in this context of death and facing mortality that the motif of art, or the motif of death in art really went across all of the disciplines. So from cadaver tombs, which depicted the living person above and the decrepit corpse below, and then below that, of course, the real corpse, to uh, the dance macabre, which was a popular genre which depicted a personified death and really reminded us that death is coming for all of us. Rich, poor, saintly, depraved, nothing was going to save you from death. It was there for you. Vanit I'm gonna mispronounce this. <laughs> Vanitas, perhaps. Um, Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Pronunciation isn't always my uh, amazing skill. So these were lovely still lives with human skulls and icons representing the, f the fleetiness of life and the impermanence of riches. And beloved by both the bro and the goth kid alike is Memento Mori. <laughs> And although it may be in obnoxious tattoos everywhere now, it was really made iconic during this period when skulls and the hourglass surrounded by wings was put on tombs as a remembrance that you too will die. And plague columns were erected in the glory of God by those who survived. And this one in Olomotz, which I highly recommend uh, visiting both Olomotz for this and for the town itself, the Holy Trinity column was designed by Wetzel Renner, who said, to the glory of God Almighty, the Virgin Mary and the saints, I will build a column that is that in its height and splendor will be unrivaled by any other town. And he almost did. Um, he died during the process of making this. And then another artist took over and he died, and then another artist took over, and he died, and another artist took over, so that's four artists now. 
that died. And the fifth one finally completed it. It was started in 1716 and was completed by the fifth artist in 1754. It was a triumph over death. Not only was it a celebration of the end of the plague, it was a triumph over death just to get it built. But this wasn't the only one. I mean, as you travel through Europe, you see these monuments time and again, these monuments to life after death, and they were built all over the plague-ravaged world. And as you walk by them, if you're not morbid like me and, and did a lot of nerdy research about them, you probably wouldn't notice that they are about death. They are commemorating this, this huge death, and they are representing the life that came after it. And whether we like it or not, I'll say again, death is a powerful motivator. Death inspires us to live, and life inspires art. The author, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, um, <laughs> wrote, no death is possible without a dance with death. No art, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Yes, <laughs> flub up. Um, okay, let's try this again. No art is possible without a dance with death. And he was referencing back to a, a French author from World War I whose macabre art, uh, work really inspired him when he was writing Slaughterhouse-Five. So I like, <laughs> I'd like to raise a toast, I hope that your dance with death inspires great art and that that great art outlives us all. Cheers. Tonight, please join me in welcoming a great lineup of Amy, Michael, Jewel, Lightning, Kelly, and for his first talk on the Odds Lawn stage, Dan.